have people in your life who are having relationships that you admire and that you like. I can see a lot where if there are a lot of people unhappy in their relationships, it becomes a little bit contagious and it becomes spread out in, into the group. As we've been progressing as a species, we have been struggling to feel satisfied in our relationships. And I think that the advent of social media and the internet and the seeming availability of whatever we want at our fingertips has increased our level of dissatisfaction with our real life human relationships. Therese, thank you so much for joining me today. What a pleasure to be here. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. I'm happy that you're here as well because I've got so many questions to ask you. And I think the area that you work in relationship therapy is so relatable on so many levels for many people. The first thing would be good to know is just have a bit of an introduction to yourself. Well, I've actually been working in the therapy field for nearly 20 years now, which just blows my mind whenever I um, think about that. But um, yeah, I mean, I just studied um, psychology as normal. And then from there, kind of developed various specialties, starting off with addiction and family work. And then it became very, very clear that relationships were something that I had a natural affinity to and also something that really resonated with all the people that I've worked with. So just over the years and a couple of decades now, that's just been what's really always come back to me about what's been most beneficial for the people I work with but also what I kind of naturally am really interested in and, and quite intrigued by. So I love telling people that I talk about love for a living because uh, that feels like an incredible way to you know, spend my time. And um, What do you think drew you into it? I guess I've always been fascinated by what we do as humans. And um, I started out my career, um, well, I did volunteer work at various places, but when I was actually working, I worked in a rehab. And I really enjoyed working with the family members and then working with the patients who were receiving treatment within the treatment center. And it was all about trying to bring about happier and more harmonious relationships. And it was just something that I loved. I just couldn't get enough of it. And I sort of found my way a little bit and I felt like I could sort of see things in, in a way and express that in a way with people that seem to really, really resonate. So it just felt like a very natural fit. My my career has felt really organic. Yeah. It's never been you know, a, this is what I want to do. And it's just sort of naturally just fallen and gone the way that it has gone. And um, I feel very grateful for that because I feel like I'm doing exactly what I should be doing. I definitely want to ask you about that pivot where you were working in the rehab facility to when you co-founded your own treatment center. And before I do that, I think for those people who don't know, it'd be really good to have a definition in your own words on what is a relationship therapist. I think it has changed a lot over the years. You know, I specifically call myself a relationship therapist rather than a couples therapist because it doesn't, it's not just about working with two people. You can I often work with, with one person on their relationship or I can work with multiple people and I can be working with family members. We've all heard of um, emotional intelligence and I think something that's become much more relevant and also kind of the next step for us is something called relational intelligence. And um, an interesting thing is happening in our world now where we're becoming more individualistic and what we want is, as, as individuals and what our pursuits are are quite singular and quite individual. But then we're also wanting really fulfilling and wonderful relationships and we are struggling on how to be relational, how to develop the skills that we need in relationships. We're really good and we spend a lot of time developing and, you know, following our own dreams and pushing ourselves, but actually learning about relationships and what sustains relationships and what brings about really fun, sexy, cool relationships, a lot of us don't actually understand. So relationship therapy speaks of that. How do we learn to be more relational in our lives, valuing each other, respecting people, having difficult conversations and really developing ourselves away from the individual into something that's actually much more about the group or the relationship, the partnership, and that being really a priority and something to very much value. When it comes to relationships, one thing that I've seen you say a lot is about how um, a lot of what we do in relationships is fear-based. If we could have some context on what that means and why you think that is. Yeah, I mean, something that I always say is that we are so vulnerable in our relationships. It's where we feel the most exposed. And we're also, um, 
the most vulnerable to rejection and abandonment. And just on a on a biological animalistic level, we you know rejection and abandonment is very very dangerous for for us. And so on a on a primal level, we know we need to be very very scared of that. And I think the way our world is now is it's really exacerbating that because we don't have the belonging of the village or the tribe or, you know, the community. We are living our very sort of separate lives and we can be living in different countries and different continents and we can be exploring all sorts of things. And so that level of security that we would get in the past, and obviously I'm talking quite a long time ago, but we don't have that anymore. And and we're becoming quite fragmented as a society. There are not a lot of groups that we really feel that we belong to that feels very sustaining and very, very safe. So I think we are more frightened in our bodies and in our relationships now a lot hangs on our romantic relationships before we would be part of the group part of the village part of the tribe we would we would belong people would love us we would you know know that we would be looked after we would be okay we would be provided for now that's really on us and our intimate relationships so the stakes are really high we want a lot we need a lot and with that comes a lot of fear and so we're juggling a lot of things there that are very very frightening and I think it's really useful to just be frank about that we bring a lot of fear to our relationships because of past traumas and experiences that we've had in our relationships but also biologically we're not living how we are made to live which we're asking very very different things of ourselves and with that increases I think a lack of security and a lack of that kind of relational safety. Interesting do you think there are practical tips on what we can do to try and achieve what happened back in the day? in the modern day era now? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I I encourage my clients in relationships and outside of relationships to really keep their lives really, really big and to invite people into um, their lives because we all know as we get older and life becomes more complicated and, you know, we move away from our friendship groups, we move away from jobs where we had a really great, you know, group of friends. And we don't have this continuous social network. We we really, really need to have that. You know, on the one hand, we're so connected nowadays. And then on the other hand, we're so disconnected, right? I love when I'm working with people in relationship, I, I will say have friends that are in relationships and, and not in relationships, really, really keep your life big, but also have people in your life who are having relationships that you admire and that you like because there's this, there's still that whole like you know birds of a feather flock together thing I can see a lot where if there are a lot of people unhappy in their relationships it becomes a little bit contagious and it becomes spread out in into the group but likewise if we're single I think it's really important to keep developing our tribe keep inviting people into our life have people that are like us that are single or and want to be single or want to be in a relationship whatever and then also have couples that you can emulate other relationships that you that you admire all those kind of things help us remind our body that we are okay we're safe we're part of something bigger than just us we're not so alone in the world we're not isolated and it also keeps that muscle going that relational muscle which is we value other relationships and we are learning all the time how to communicate how to relate how to engage with people because that's actually something that we can lose quite quickly. We can we can become quite reclusive and quite small in our lives, and these important skills become underdeveloped. It's interesting you've gone in that direction. That's exactly the kind of question I was going to ask you afterwards, because especially around social media, I know you touched on earlier about how we become more reliant on our devices. When it comes to social media, that now impacts so much of how we not only like maintain our relationships and keep in touch with people but how we formulate them and build on them as well especially in the world of dating I guess it'd be good to know from your perspective when it comes to maintaining and building on relationships what do you think has been the impact of this new digital tech social media world I think it's created more difference when I'm working with people on their relationships one of the biggest things that we have to tackle is managing the differences in the relationship and Social media brings up even more differences. You know, what is acceptable to one person, what is fun and, you know, harmless for one person isn't for the other other person or people. It just kind of highlights um, a different value system or different ways of doing things. 
and it creates more things for people to have to work through and kind of un understand. I think there's something interesting about social media, which is this kind of private public kind of merging that things that maybe did in private now suddenly become quite sort of public or at the same time as we're looking at, you know, baby photos of, of a friend, we can be looking at a highly sexualized picture of, you know, another person that we follow or, or whatever. So I think there are challenges that are coming around. There aren't sort of natural boundaries in our world anymore about this is where I do this. This is where I do that. This is where I have these kind of relationships. This is a sexual space. This is a family space. Everything feels quite merged and quite messy in that way. So for the people I work with, it does create problems. It creates barriers to um, closeness because I think social media exposes parts of our personality that should actually maybe be quite private but are now certainly quite pro quite public and on this topic as well I, I wanted to ask you more about habits and how our behaviors when it comes to interacting with social media or just being tied to our devices how that has impacted our habits when we are building and maintaining relationships outside of these devices so the reason why I wanted to ask you as well is because obviously you built your career at a time which was pre, you know, media. And so I think a lot of people would benefit from your perspective because you would have seen what we were like before and then what we've been like after. Have you noticed any habits that we should be conscious and aware of? Well, obviously with me working in a rehabs prior to this, um, I can obviously tell you that there's been a massive um, impact in terms of pornography and sort of um, creating relationships and online relationships and sexting and these things that are really happened behind closed doors and was very, very secretive and shameful is almost kind of just normalized now. And and on on the one hand, that that's really, really healthy. But I think anyone who has issues around faithfulness or sex addiction or, you know, just having sort of issues around compulsions. Yeah. The brain and how we are sort of being trained to use these devices and all the stuff that is available on social media and on the internet in general, I think is making relationships a little bit harder. Something that, you know, I think as we've been progressing as a species, we have been struggling to feel satisfied in our relationships. And I think that the advent of social media and the internet and the seeming availability of whatever we want at our fingertips has increased our level of dissatisfaction with our real life human relationships. I think there was a statistic, and this is quite a while ago, so it's probably worse now, but I can I think I think I'm right in saying that our attention span used to be twelve seconds as humans. That was our attention span. And then a few few years into sort of the internet and social media, it sort of reduced to nine. So was, and in terms of, you know, stats, I mean, that is a significant jump in a very, very short period of time. And I would wager that, that it's probably gone down since then because this was many years ago I was reading this uh, research. And that really impacts our lives because that really talks about our ability to do several things, which is tolerate our emotions, something we really have to do in our relationships. We really have to be okay with feeling frustrated, feeling angry, feeling hurt, and then communicating that in a certain way. So, so losing attention, losing concentration, and then also to a degree losing patience, that has a really, really, really big impact on how we engage with each other. There is much more impatience. There's a real struggle to sit with our feelings, which is always a big therapy topic, like let's sit with our feelings and how's everyone feeling? We don't know what we're feeling because we're being mood altered every minute of the day on our um, devices. So I've definitely observed a numbing out in people that would have a natural propensity to be sort of checking out of relationships and also an impatience and dissatisfaction with people for whom that would, you know, would have been an issue, but it is now exacerbated even more because we're shown unrealistic, you know, lives that we should be living on on social media. But our brain chemistry is also changing because we are getting used to, you know, little moments of hits of dopamine and feeling a certain way and 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 feeling good. And relationships are not instant gratifiers; they are slow burn over time and years developing. You know, getting our hit of achievement takes time in relationships and time is something that most of us don't really want to give much anymore and that 
I think that's a big problem for us. I want to talk a little bit about self-awareness because there were two things that I noticed quite a lot when I was researching your videos and I was looking through your content. That self-awareness was the big thing that sort of came up quite a lot and also being more aware of the thoughts in our head when it comes to our feelings, our emotions. So if we start off with self-awareness, it'd be good to know what are some of the practical ways that we can build on our self-awareness when it comes to relationships? I mean, that's a great question because it's so important. We, Because of how we are built, we, we look outside of ourselves and we will look to the other person and we'll be over-focused on, on what someone else is doing. And sometimes we really lack insight into our own processes and what's, what's going on for us. So a typical therapy tool is for us to hone and develop the skill of observing ourselves. So we take a little bit of an emotional step back from ourselves and we notice what we do. We notice what we think. We notice how we react. So after a while of people working with me, you know, they'll say things like, oh, well, you know, I had this argument and I noticed I got really defensive when this thing was brought up or I suddenly realized that um, I actually had just shut down and was really, really frozen. And that is really, really helpful because we are turning up the focus a little bit away from the relentless blame that we can often do with others onto ourselves and be like, what am I doing here? And that's like the first step. What am I doing here? And then, of course, why? Mm -hmm. Why am I shutting down? Why am I defensive? Why why does this bug me so much? Why does this get under my skin and not this? And, you know, we kind of really, you know, encourage um, clients to be curious about don't just accept what you think and, and how you react. Like really question what this can teach you about yourself because we need to know about ourselves to then teach someone else, hey, this is what upsets me. You know, because of these experiences I've had in my life, when you talk to me this way, it actually goes deeper than you realize and it actually feels really disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Let's try to change that. And, you know, we are able to then really educate ourselves and each other about what is going on for us because, the vast majority of what we think and what we say and what we do, we are completely unaware of what we're doing. You know, as any psychotherapy will um, teach us is that we're really unconscious of what we're doing a lot of the time. So the whole purpose of therapy is to increase our conscious awareness of what we are doing. Why are we doing that? Well, there is a reason. It's not random that we like these kind of people but don't like those kind of people or get triggered by this or hate that or couldn't care less about this but our friend literally cannot bear it you know we are all going to have stuff that that has meaning to us and it's really useful for us to understand what that is because otherwise we don't really know ourselves and we don't really even recognize why or how we're experiencing life the way that we are and when it comes to working on that and you've got these internal dialogues and thoughts happening feels like the first job is to be self-aware of those thoughts. There's an extra bit of work in being aware of how those thoughts impact the relationship itself. Yes, yes. And I think that's that's what can be a jump for a lot of people. It's, sometimes it's really hard to take it out of yourself and think about that it's going to impact someone else. So is there any practical advice there where we can improve our skills in that area? Definitely. Well, I think, you know, that's such a great little formula that you've just created there. And and that's right. It kind of speaks of this thing of, you know, emotional intelligence. Like I am intelligent. I am aware to what is going on for me emotionally. I notice I'm angry. I can see that I'm scared. I'm actually really excited or I feel really jealous of that person. You know, and we can be honest about that. You know, we have emotional intelligence. I think we've progressed as a species enough to really be able to sort of see that. But that second bit of the equation, which, as you say, is quite rare for us to think, okay, well, how does this impact my relationship and how might this impact the other person? And is that something I want to continue? Is it helpful? That, for me, is the relational intelligence, you know, so that we can have the emotional intelligence. And we're really great if we get there. And that is where most people will kind of stop. And in therapy, we can have a lot of kind of competitive emotional intelligence about people sharing insights into themselves and whatever. 
but it is quite a leap now to have the relational intelligence to go, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this as a team? Mm -hmm. How do I take responsibility for this, these insights I have into myself and grow and become stronger? So I think thinking about how we are in the world and how we are in relationships, we really need to think about accountability. How are we being accountable for what we're experiencing and going on? So developing the skill of having insight into ourselves, having that emotional intelligence, helping that help us as individuals grow and learn about ourselves. Then, we can, then we've got all this useful information to then use in a relationship with someone else sharing their insights about themselves that's when we can be accountable and we have the best chance of creating something new, something different in our relationships. So I think the accountability that goes with being relational is the next really important step. Let's talk about accountability because especially in personal relationships with a partner, it can be difficult in the moment or even afterwards actually to take responsibility for how your actions were once doing that, but then also doing that without feeling like you're taking responsibility for the whole yeah. it'd be good to get your views on how we can be more responsible or take responsibility in our relationships and if and when we need to be able to do that. Mm. I think that's such an important distinction. I think people, we could, as people, we can be over-responsible and we can be under-responsible. It's quite something to just be appropriately responsible you know, and, and, and you're right. I think there is a danger of being like, oh, God, you know what? I did that. My bad. Shouldn't have said that. And then the other person or, or people involved could be like, yeah, you shouldn't have. And, you know, that's on you type thing. And, you know, sometimes that is the case. Sometimes it is as simple as that. But relationships are complex and how we relate to each other is extremely complex. So often it isn't that, you know, it is as soon as there's more than one person involved, it's a dynamic. That means we're all ricocheting off each other and um, having an impact. So I think we have to have a degree of self-esteem to take responsibility because it doesn't mean that we're this awful person and something terrible has kind of happened, but we're also not going to let everything now be on us. And that can happen in relationships. You know, we, we really like to blame in relationships it's great that we can blame the other person and that's always such a large piece of work in relationship therapy is about oh my goodness resisting blame because blame stops us from growing and it also you know brings out nothing but defensiveness in the other person so I think really working on our own self-esteem and kind of being able to assertively and sort of with a degree of self-respect, be able to be responsible, but to also, where necessary, hold someone else responsible. There's a great saying that we have in relationship therapy, which is we are all 100% responsible for our 50%. And sort of that speaks of something really important. So even, so you can take 100% responsibility for your 50%, but it's still only 50%. Because often our partners have not responded very kindly, or they were actually very human as well. And we're sort of battling it out but we've got a sort of low self-esteem issue when we're being over responsible and we can be overly apologetic and we can be down on ourselves and it's all our own fault and and that is not healthy for anyone and that you know a lot of relationships have you know someone in in that like like that and then we've got someone under responsible who's maybe a little bit grandiose and like doesn't think they have any issues and you know don't really feel they need to take responsibility for anything and you know often these people are in relationship with each other and so that's really important to then bring about this idea of 50, you got 50% and you know what, you got 50% too. So where is it? And someone is sort of lacking insight into them themselves here. And someone is sort of having a little bit too low of a self-esteem here. So the work becomes about balancing things out because yeah, we have to have the appropriate self-esteem that we can admit our faults, but we can also have the appropriate self-esteem that we don't collapse under the weight of us just being human and that we can take responsibility and hold someone else responsible and be more adult in our ways of being rather than one up or one down where kind of there's an equality there. I want to go back a little bit in your journey. So you were working as a counsellor in a rehab facility and operating group sessions and it's a very clear pivot because the next step in your journey was to co-found your own treatment centre. Was business 
always something that you wanted to get into? What was it that made you want to start your own treatment center? It's really interesting because I think the people that I worked with saw in me um, maybe some sort of leadership that I guess I didn't recognize in myself. I was very young when I started working there. I was 25 and I was 29 when I started the the treatment centers. It's pretty amazing looking back. Um, and so even though I was only at the treatment center for like three, three and a half years, I actually moved into sort of managerial roles quite quickly. And I did find that I really enjoyed that. And I was actually given an amazing opportunity by them. And um, I can still remember the meeting with this great guy I worked with, Robin. And he, um, there was this facility. It was like a building and there were lots of different sections. There was one section that had been an adolescent unit and they didn't want to do that anymore. So they closed that down. And um, he said, we've got this unit. What do you think we should do with it? And that was my first kind of foray into that. And I came up with this idea of, you know, creating personalized care and offering people, you know, tailor-made, you know, programs and stuff. And he, you know, credit to him, he said, okay, let's give it a go. And so I actually, within that organization, was, was sort of given a lot of freedom to try something and try my hand at creating something literally from scratch. And, and I did love it. I really, really enjoyed it. Obviously it wasn't my job to sort of do the sort of business side of it per se, because it was an ongoing concern already, but it was something that became very, very lucrative and really um, quite successful. And I believe it was one of the only parts of the company that's still going today. Yeah. And so it was, it was in doing that, that I kind of got the confidence. And um, one of my colleagues said to me, you know, we could be doing this for ourselves because I felt like it wasn't really how I wanted it to be. And I could see how it could be better. And, um, and then, yeah, the opportunity presented itself with uh, my colleague and we, and we struck out on our own. And so it was a very exciting time, but I'm very, very grateful to that first treatment center that I worked at because they really um, believed in me. And, you know, I, I was a really dream employee I think because I was just really hard working and I was desperate to learn and I just shattered all the senior people and um, I just couldn't get enough of it so I was very very hungry I was you know it's taken me a long time for me to admit that I'm quite an ambitious person and I probably seemed like ruthlessly ambitious to the people around me but I guess I did and do always want to keep pushing myself and challenging myself because that is something I've done throughout my career and that was a really big exciting um, step so it was a pivot but it also wasn't because it was already happening within the treatment center I was working. And when you did that when you stepped into business you've now almost got two jobs because you're doing all the work you're doing with relationship therapy but then you're also learning how to be a business person and how to make a business grow and marketing and were there any skills that you remember at that time that you really had to upskill in well I think um, the biggest thing for me was just taking responsibility for the fear of keeping the business going okay because I had had the protection of working for another organization and and I sort of look back and you know that was my understanding of the partnership that I went in as a co-founder, that I was kind of going to be the lead clinically about what we were doing in terms of the program and the staffing and what we were going to run and what we were going to offer. And my partner, my business partner, was going to do more of the business. And And looking back now, I think I could have supported him in running the business a lot more. I was very, very focused on what I was doing. And whenever he and I had our team meetings, I think – the skills that I needed to learn that I don't think I learned particularly well in that time was about budgeting and understanding things like that. And and there were a lot of solutions that I came up with that I feel like were really helpful in terms of keeping costs down. But I think it was a steep learning curve for me doing what I was doing clinically. And so my business partner and I were a bit separate in that way. We were We were doing different things so yeah it was only really when I left um, that organization and started my private practice and now my Instagram I'm getting back in touch with this idea of being more business minded and wanting to grow something and how do I do that and how do I get funding and you know how do I sort of really practically and financially support what I'm trying to grow and talking of Instagram because that is a place that you really helped a lot of people through your videos and your advice. And, and I think it'd be good to know what were your experience with Instagram? Did you did you realize it was going to get this big? No, I mean, I feel like I've, I've come very late to the party. And for me, I am thrilled by Instagram, actually, because I do feel 
there's a lot of negativity going on with it and there's a lot of comparison and pain but there is also a really unique way of getting a lot of great information and I do believe it is helping a lot of people on a daily basis and that's how we grow that's how we change you know it's just daily reminders daily you know little efforts into doing stuff not even once a week in therapy or with our own personal growth but to just have daily you know focus on what we're trying to do and who we're, who we're trying to become that's what we need and I'm blown away by the, the talent that has a platform now that anyone can sort of bring bring their talents and bring what they want to share I find that a really exciting wonderful thing I wish I'd done it earlier because as I say I feel like I'm very very late to the party but um for me, I love it. It was a big, scary, exposing thing to go from a consulting room that where no one ever sees me more than a handful of people to suddenly putting myself out there online. So that was very, very daunting for quite a while. But I feel quite comfortable on it now and sort of excited about the prospects. So one thing that we like to talk about on this podcast is being open to some of the things that we didn't know in our journey that we do know now and sort of dispelling this this myth and idea that we all have to be so perfect all the time and have to know all the answers. You can actually choose where in your career this question will relate to, but it'd be really good to know something that you didn't know at one point that you do know now and it's really helped you. I think for me, something that's really incredible and I'm so happy about is when I started out, when I finished my, well, when I finished my undergraduate studying and I started working, I felt like my career and the way I was going to work was going to like really fit into the stocks and it was going to be, it was just going to be this, this one way. And I guess that's part of what we were saying earlier about how the world hadn't exploded in the way that it has online and everything else. So, you know, it felt like I had so few options and and in many ways, that made life a little bit easier because it was like, well, you want to do this, this, and this, and you get this office job or this office job or this office job. And um, things have changed so rapidly in the last kind of 10 years and certainly in the last kind of three or three or four years that what I didn't know then, maybe about myself, but also about the world is, and this is what I encourage my clients to do, is we can create what we want. And that is such a huge privilege that you know a lot of us have that we can there are so many ways to earn money now and there are so many ways of marketing ourselves that are completely free in 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 my day people you know you had to pay someone to market you you had you had business cards and you had to pay for those so being able to have a lot of freedom now to have options and to really recreate careers in ways that you never could have imagined like I'm doing now with mine how do I go from sitting in a room with someone Mm -hmm. to now I'm on Instagram writing a book creating courses you know that is just it would have been unthinkable for me 10 10 years ago but I I really enjoy kind of doing things differently and being able to create things and really kind of challenge the status quo so that that's something that I didn't feel at the beginning of my career and I felt kind of quite stuck. Whereas now I feel more excited and hopeful about the future. And I'm can't wait to see what where I'm what I'm gonna be doing in five years' time and in ten years' time because I probably can't even imagine what that will be because that's how how exciting our, our lives can be and how things can change so much. Would there be anything that you feel now that you are not so sure on that you would like to improve on or know more about? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. I mean, so many things, (laughs) so many things. I mean, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now, which is being challenged, challenged to be a little bit more of a public speaker. I'm really being challenged to be a writer now, which has been a lifelong dream. And now that I'm actually doing it, it is really extremely challenging and hard. And so I really want to grow in that way. And I always want to grow to be a better practitioner and a better clinician you know what I love about being a therapist is actually the older you get the more kind of kudos you actually have there are some careers where the older you get you just sort of lose it it's kind of the longer I am a therapist the more um, wise I can hopefully become and the more training that I do so I I really like that I like being able to learn and I also like being able to work for myself And that I can work whenever I want. You know, my old supervisor was in her 80s. 
you know, I literally worked with her until she was no longer with us. You know, I love that idea of my work being a meaningful part of my life always. And I always want to keep challenging myself in any way I can with that. I think that's a great place to end the interview. Before you go, um, can you share with us where people can learn more about you, where they can find you on social? Sure. The best place to um, access my work is on Instagram. And my Instagram handle is at Sharice Cook, which is C-H-A-R-I-S-S-E-C-O-O-K-E. And also my website, sharicecook.com. I've got all my teachings available on my website. And I've actually laid the website out in such a way that you can go on a bit of a therapy journey. And all my key teachings are there, articles, videos, journaling prompts. There's a lot there that is all for free. It's you know really something that means a lot to me that I think people need to know about themselves and their relationships. And then my Instagram account is just about reminding us all, keeping us on track challenging us and um, just giving us daily support and daily prompts to just keep doing what we know we need to do and to keep growing. 